Our first reader, Lowell Yeager, is a poet well known to everyone in Missoula. He lives at Yellow Bay at Flathead Lake. He teaches at the Flathead Valley Community College. He has several books out, War on War, Hope Against Hope, both published by Utah State University Press, Law of the Fish, a chapbook published by Wright Impressions. He has uh, another book coming out from Utah State University Press in the spring of 1992, King of Kings. Lowell Yeager has won an NEA uh, grant in 1986, the Grolier Poetry Peace Prize in 1987, and this year he received Pushcart Prize. Please welcome Lowell Yeager. Thanks for coming. Always nice to see people show up at these things. I'll read for about 45 minutes and I'll say thanks for staying. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling uh, kind of crabby. I was just talking to a couple of friends of mine, Phil Burgess and Jim Sular, and we've been getting uh, increasingly crabby since August 2nd. It's just really hard to be out of the Vietnam era and uh, be very optimistic about war. But don't get me wrong, it's also very optimistic. Be, it's also difficult to be optimistic about the peace movement, too. So I'm going to read some crabby poems tonight. Deja Vu. The first poem's called, um, Let's Hope This Thing Blows Over Soon. The Chinese, is all my father said, when my mother asked, who were we fighting with a nuclear sunshine on the snow so immaculate it hurt my eyes? Three cars ahead of us and I couldn't count how many behind, all burning headlights and flying colors on each antenna, yellow and black of the first funeral I ever knew. Why? My mother asked and my father shrugged, our attic full of souvenirs from the Allied invasion, 20 years old, but he had no recollection now. A dead relative, in our congressional district where cows outnumbered Republicans, he was the first young man home in a box from some battlefield whose name I couldn't recall. Second cousin who took my hand years ago as we toured his Holsteins, their stanchions locked in a whitewashed barn larger than my own backyard. Watch your step, watch your step. I remembered him laughing, then he shouldered me like a sack of potatoes through the air of night back into the living room where our parents halted their gab and then guffawed at the thick splash of manure beneath my shoes. He died watching his step through a minefield, though his coffin face had forgotten, eyebrows penciled in place, rouge dusted on his cheeks and on his only almost human looking hand. One empty black sleeve on his dress uniform pressed and folded neatly across his chest. I wasn't so brave as to touch him like most my aunts who also talked how handsome he had grown and how just like the last war, other heroes came home dead too. I wondered, where was that arm? Was it under water somewhere? Might some barefoot kid harvesting rice kick it loose and find it reaching after him nearby? In the cemetery, the sun exploded on new snow. I followed in my father's footsteps, blinded, careful not to stumble over bodies lying all around. Then a short sermon to save us all from frostbite. I let my father put the dead weight of his arm on my shoulders. Let's hope this thing blows over soon, he said. And I knew what he was talking about with me in the ninth grade and a brother old enough to drive. 
but I was curious how below zero the bugler's mouthpiece must have scorched his lips and how the coffin slipped from its scaffold into its concrete case with a sack of potatoes thud and when the ten gun salute blasted the elms above how their icicles stabbed to the earth shattering the delicate safety of our lives. If you've been listening to the news, uh, you know, everyone has, uh, except for those of us who are starting to deny it. Uh, and, excuse me? Thank you. <laughs> uh, you've been watching this thing where they say the hero of this war is the Patriot missile. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to, I'd like to get a portrait of the Patriot missile profile, right? Of the Patriot missile, frame it, and write on the bottom, our hero. Hang that in a fourth grade room, and I'll, let's, I'll, I'll guarantee you, a 10-year-old ten, ten will see how ridiculous that sort of notion is. A 10-year-old will see that, uh, and, and yet we keep hearing over and over on the news that uh, the hero of this war is the Patriot missile. Where have we come if, uh, you know, our hero, Something, something seems strange there. Um, this is a poem uh, also out of Warren Wall called Artifacts. It's about growing up with uh, junk from World War II that my father brought home. Backside of the busted globe bricks and boards on the streets of the armistice and my father stuffed his canvas duffel with wounded artifacts of fresh dead war. He was alive without an explanation. He lugged all this junk home so the last of the Nazis lived in our attic till their leather memories cracked on the temperate extremes of my father's reprieve. Kneeling under the pitch of rafters, he fingered those rusted helmets and guns and knives, pointing how deeply he doubted it all. The black accidental hole in the flyer's cap told me everything he didn't say. But in those iron helmets and the ignorance of my father's image on me, border for border I stormed the neighbor's lawn. In the boulevard infantry my brothers fell, their eight, nine years of reckless elbows and knees, ridiculously naked, ridiculously still. Then one day the swastika inked on the adjustable headband erased itself in the perspiration around my ears. My father warned us not to shoot each other's eyes out with the sharp sticks we shouldered till he took them all away. I wished by my father's troubled face I hadn't lost his swastika. He confiscated the helmets too. They hung themselves in our garage, their gloomy thoughts beyond our grasp. The Lugers my mother ruined because her stomach turned on the pick pick of the firing pin Sunday afternoon from the lawn chairs where my father tutored us at the trigger safety on safety off always the business end opposite our lives my mother forced him to surrender the clip and I suspected she tipped off the sheriff who drove away with both Tommy guns under protective custody but the Italian carbines survived, hunting deer no sooner than the ponds froze each October until an identical weapon murdered the president on our TV. And sure enough, that flyer's cap flapped again against my oldest brother's chin, launching a fetish for power, his motorbike roaring like a guided missile, the Iron Cross bombing every crowd who looked his way. But I, I think it's true. Um, Phil Burgess, my friend, who's a counselor, was saying to me just as uh, I came in here, he said, you know, if there is such a thing as a, as a kind of collective consciousness in humanity, something like this happens. You know, our species goes around murdering each other, and mass annihilation engages in this strange practice. Uh, do, do you feel it? Do you feel it? 
I mean, I, I teach with a guy who I taught with for eight years, and he's, I never saw him get angry once. He got in a fist fight o with a truck driver over, over somebody cutting him off on the road, you know. I mean, do you, are you feeling that stuff? If you're writers, I mean, I know you must be feeling it too. I mean, what, what else can we approach it? What can you talk about at this time when there's something like this going on? It, everything uh, seems to be somehow shaded by this whole event. Uh, so I've, I've done my best. Uh, what I'm doing is uh, I've become a homosexual necrophiliac kleptomaniac. And uh, recently what I'm... Yeah, it's true. I'm, uh, God, Missoula is such an open crowd. You say that in Kalispell, you'd lose him. Uh, uh, what I've done is I've... Rethke's got, got, uh, David Wagner's got a book of Rethke's uh, little clips out of Rethke's journals. Uh, it's called Straw for the Fire. And uh, Rethke left all these unfinished poems and these lines and everything. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm digging up that corks, fucking them over and robbing them. Okay? And, and so, uh, so th I, this, this is the, I'm, st I'm doing a whole series of these poems and, and this is the first one called Straw for the Fire. But but you can see how, how this, you know, the war thing just keeps coming in and coming in and coming in. It's, you know, I, I don't want to do this all my life. I hope this goddamn war ends, you know. So it's called Straw for the Fire. All by your little selves, huddled in secret, here or there, if not in this place, then some place where you'd grown beyond how I would have stopped you if I could have but that's not what the stars twinkled that night above our camp where you two sisters whispered and blasphemed tooth fairies, Easter bunnies, Santa Claus with a brave no such thing, no such thing hushed whenever I came near as if I weren't old enough to face the truth of how my daughters wouldn't smile the old cheerful lies I had so much enjoyed providing them with a world of elves and yellow polka dot eggs all nixed forever just as I stooped to the coals where our potatoes simmered in tinfoil I heard you ask about God I heard you ask about God was God real and just then when I looked up at your face smoldering in shadow and flame opening as you dared in me a glimpse of the grown-up world where you too will someday wish you could close your eyes to bodies scattered on the battlefields all over a planet kindled with hatred, with greed, with ignorance and cowardice and might. And I wanted to answer, I hope so. I hope there's a God to save us all from each other, from ourselves. But all I did was gather sticks. I shrugged. I set to blaze my heart out for you, my children, another handful of straw for the fire. See, so what I've done is I've taken that... Thanks. What I've done is I've taken that line from Rethke's straw for the fire and stole it. And, um, or like here, for instance, uh, this is one where I steal the line. Rethke's got this, you, you got to get this book. I'm sure they got it at the library. It's called Straw for the Fire. And Rethke's got better scraps than most of us have finished work. You know what I mean? Uh, he, he, here's a, this is a, actually from a quatrain. Let's see, how does it go? The question cries again, what is the least we know? Um, I call the slug my kin. And I'm born with those. Mo I move with those born slow. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Wonderful stuff. You know. I mean, he's full of self-loathing because he's, he knows what humanity is. I guess. Uh, but, but he's got this other. This, this one I steal. A, this little line: uh, "The angels ask, but never answer. The angels ask, but never answer." And it's a poem called "Getting Ahead." Start by believing every lie you ever told yourself. Then fight to overcome all notions you're not who you think you are. This gets things stirred up. Neighbors, friends, family. Everyone near you will shake her head, twirl a finger beside her ear as if to say, he's foolish if he thinks he's better than the rest of us. 
and they'll go on without you. They'll practice pinning their lives down like bugs on display, showing just the appropriate colors, never wincing even when it's painful, struggling not to struggle, and wanting to look nice in the exact spot where others expect they should dry their insides out perfectly, never having chipped a wing on some crazy ambition to fly. Good. You don't need them at least not at first, not until the day you're sick to death of yourself. This will be the morning you wake after having accomplished something stupid or cruel. Like maybe you've succeeded in locking your teenage daughter in her room all night sobbing like a sailor's widow because you've convinced her she's worthless and doomed if she ever dares to step out into the world on her own. That will be the day of enlightenment, the time you double back on yourself, phoning forgotten friends to confess you've been lying to yourself all along. And it's likely to sting how these people have been stuck so tight they've finally wriggled free. In fact, it's as if they've just busted like hungry worms, punching out the walls of the world's cocoon, lauding you for showing them some better way. But you're no more trying to get ahead since you've determined all lives are pretty much the same. You sit on your daughter's bed, glad when she reaches and holds your hand. In the silences between each pulse in your chest, a small voice stammers to collect and order the words it has always wanted to say. What is it, Father? whispers your daughter with the same compassion you once felt for fools who considered you the greater fool still. So you can't tell her she's crazy if she thinks she's better than the rest of us. What is it, Father? Because you've quit the God business, teetering on the head of a pin, a nameless dancer lost in this holiness where the angels ask but never answer. I was in Kent State on May 4th, you know, it was the 20th year. It was the 20th year since uh, uh, the four students there were killed. You know, two of which weren't even participating in the demonstration. I mean, so it seemed to me that it was strange that we were holding these people up as some sort of martyrs because two of these people had just sort of been walking by. Uh, and a lot of people there wanted to look back and be nostalgic about the 60s, you know, and, and um, it, 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 was, it was spoken a couple times how uh, the anti-war movement in the 60s ended the war, of course, in Vietnam. Isn't that silliness? I mean, the goddamn Viet Cong won that war, you know, and they had to give how many hundreds of thousand lives to do it. This is a poem called Fish Flesh. Once a wounded fish sideways floundered belly up, then riding himself like a man thrashing murky sheets of his sick bed, afloat on ebb and rise, torn betwixt rock and sky, and whatever hard place waits ever after. On the bridge rail over these dark currents I'd brooded all morning, sizzling in the buttered sunlight, less than half awake and only three weeks ahead of the birth date where all flesh burns with an urgent need to give itself away. Because I'd hooked nothing at all and couldn't face walking home empty-handed, because I knew nothing at all of order greater than counting down weeks from one birthday or school year into the next, when the great fish turned blinded and helpless in the flow, I clipped treble barbs onto my pole, played the line and lifted him snagged under the chin. Imagine what fish thoughts that must bring to be dragged body and soul skyward. And though he'd struggled some, and though I claimed I'd angled for him legally, my father grinned, cut his pocket knife into the pike's backbone, opened me to a view of how a civilization of worms had already beaten me at calling this trophy my own. Then July floated by, and I was twelve for the first time and the last time, all in the call of the soft brown river. Back then I could swim like a fish. I'd spaded the pike under apple trees where fish flesh might do some good. 
Should I have let him drown? I couldn't help but feel somehow puzzled as I side-stroked or paddled on my back and numbered each day sunlit at hand. There's a big word in this poem. It's called the word is prelapsarian. Boy, some people know that. See, I didn't know that. I had to look that up. Uh, but the poem's the poem's entitled "Prelapsarian." It's a what, what is it? It's the the time before uh, uh, the expulsion from Eden. You know, paradise time or something when before we were fully human. Prelapsarian is how she'd scribbled a synopsis of commune life on the postcard of nothing but trees, Idaho from an aerial lens, a truck stop vision racked with chocolate bars and potato chips. I had to look that word up, a time before the lexicographer stated boldly then lapsed into stammer, before what? Before goodness knows how good times disappear. I just escaped exile in paradise, or so the travel brochures proclaimed the boulevards of Stockholm, where I'd fled to save my skin from the war machine back home. Though back toward home, I wished every breath, every heartbeat, as I wandered up one cobbled street and down the next, longing for younger days of hooking bass under lily pads and backwaters of all I'd been cast out beyond. And it's true, one can't go home again after the forbidden knowledge. Men are fueled by carnivorous prehistoric appetites for whatever rises up and stands in their way. Six weeks I hid myself in the basement, having returned to my birthplace as if to curl again into the womb. But no, I shuddered in darkness, listening for the FBI's inevitable knock at my door. Then her voice in the mail, we are like children here running naked through July. So I laced a bedroll, thumbed westward, thinking of her naked at least as some sort of destination or predestination. Either way, this was October and summer was long gone. I woke to a frosted Montana sunrise and suddenly my life took a sharp turn south for Vegas sin and sunshine. Guess I got cold feet. I couldn't face an Idaho diet of sprouts and soy burgers. Never even wrote her the slightest reply. <laughs> I don't know, I've just come to this thing uh, um, where God, I wish I could make a joke out of this. I wish I could make you laugh tonight. But I've come to this thing where um, uh, I can't, I, I wish I could blame somebody for the war. You know, I wish I could. I wish I had a target. I wish I had somebody to get mad at. But I always, I find it right here. And, and this is a poem about that, although I didn't know it was a poem about that. It's, called, it's a poem about transplanting lady slippers. You know, lady slippers, you know. See, I mean, I'm a human being. You know what I did? I drove up on the Swan Highway there, up into the Swan Range, and uh, I saw these lady slippers, you know, sort of bobbing in the, in the bog there. And I, get, I, had took, I had a shovel in the, in the back end of my car, and I got out and I dug those suckers up. And I put them in a pail. And I took them home. And I killed them, because they died, right? So this is called transplanting lady slippers. With shovel, spade, rusty bucket in the trunk, I drove the rich mud road where no car should go up the mountainside past boulders a hundred times my weight and parked in the shadow beneath such a great stone leaning out that at first my breath caught for fear this ledge should topple over me thoughtlessly as I might snuff a gnat. 
Boughs and the tallest pines hushed around me. Clouds looked down along the roadside tribes of fiddleheads stooped like monks over their beads, counting on the benevolence of all things bigger than themselves. Then I plodded into the creek bed, untouched by the mud suck beseeching my feet, and I dug the lady slippers, hacking where roots and rock joined, stabbing at the loam with my spade. I kneeled, bristled, sweating, short of breath. Nothing could stop me. The lady slippers nodded helpless above the rim of my bucket as we bobbed and bumped along the road back home. Next to the irises, I potted the ladies, watered and weeded them until they withered, drooped, died. That fall I burned their remains. As the flames tongued each crisp blade, I stood poking at my inferno, worried how many cruel pleasures the balance of my life might bring. So there it is. If I just had more power, I would have bombed Iraq too. Um, I want to read this sort of strange poem. It, this poem got a Pushcart Prize this year. Uh, ironically, uh, I was a student at the Yellow Bay Writers Workshop when Jim, James Tate was teaching, and he had us write these poems. He's, James Tate's a nice guy, and he's a you know he's a he's a real smart man and everything. But he he wasn't the most ambitious teacher, and he had <laughs> had us do this exercise. He said, write a poem with Big Arm Montana in it somewhere. You know, Big Arm Montana's on the reservation across the lake from Yellow Bay. So I wrote this poem about 45 minutes at lunch. High Plains Lit Review picked it up, nominated it for a Pushcart Prize, and got a Pushcart Prize. And it's sort of sort of floors me, you know, I mean, because, I mean, you know, you writers out there know the, the, the stuff you give your blood, sweat, and tears to, and nobody ever even, nobody even ever reads the shit. <laughs> and you grind something out in 45 minutes, and they love it, you know. It's called trading, actually, I don't, you know, I don't hate this poem. It's just that it doesn't have the blood, sweat, and tears to it that... that. But it's called Trading Places. Red sky in the morning over Big Arm, Montana. And the tribe looks not so brave. Fat, brown sixth graders kick stones into the road as you drive by. You've got some place to go, and that's the difference between your day and theirs. Funny how the world turns. These kids smash windows at the new rec center, not because they want in, they want out. They long to be your hands on the wheel in the stale, conditioned air of your cushy little car. They yearn for your worries, debts, and would likely do better with them than you. They'd empty your sack of sorrows at their feet and scuff them down the asphalt. They'd shatter your debts and run away. Meanwhile, you'd perch like a pilgrim on some cold rock over the lake, worry old chants out of tune. You'd insist on a deed, soul rights to this native paradise. Look, you'd tell yourself one day, you've got debts, need a job, you've got some place to go. You drop a hard to part with hundred bucks on a set of retreads. This young father down the block says he's lost his job and so he must move on, must liquidate at prices. He can hardly imagine a sucker like you could refuse. Less than a year later, the tires blister and peel. You remember that young guy's handshake, his smile like he was doing a favor by letting you believe you were doing one too. So you drive on down there to complain, but sure enough, he's gone. You're stuck with no one but yourself effing this and wishing that. You'd settled for picking through his record albums, and when he'd rolled out those beautiful, brand new, hardly ever used tires, why in God's name couldn't you have shrugged and walked away? Because you wanted to cheat him, that's why. Because he looked so foolish standing there in his drive, the guts and clutter of his mobile home tagged and scattered, selling almost as fast as he dragged it out for someone else to haul it away. You got what you paid for. All the way back to your place a year later, you listen to shreds of your greed banging in the wheel wells loud enough, strangers turn and stare. Why not wave to them? Own up to your own undoing. 
Better yet, if you look desperate and dumb enough, no doubt some other vulture will convince himself, grinning with condescension, those well-worn treads may still be worth a few good miles. All day this highway strings no-name towns like crude stones, a rosary in the hands of a worried man. Here's another, water tower, empty boxcars, grain elevator, pick up loads of hay bales parked in front of the first bar, some cars hid beside the other, gas pumps at the only grocery store in town, barren schoolyard and behind the old brick gymnasium, the district's fleet, three yellow buses likely sick to death of vomit and sticky hands. But I don't hear anyone complain, not even slow as I'm barely over the limit. Glad I've gas enough not to be idle in the midst of old folks here passing these storefronts on to young folks doomed to be old folks before too long. Fact is they even seem to like it or haven't a clue of anything other than years tagged and tallied the market worth of one crop into the next. This couple of kids, for instance, holding hands on the highway, he and she look up, smile sweetly as I drive by, and I'd bet he won that letter as a wrestler, captain of the team. He's seen the six o'clock news, ragged lunatics sleeping in the alleys, drug runners driving Cadillacs, race riots, war, and he'd be the senator someday who'd do something about it. And she's the class brain, even in math, though she loves Frost and she can read Cummings and she knows Plath best of all. She has no one to talk with and someday she'd say it all in a book for others like herself who tremble to read and glimpse their lives lived countless times before. So I want to roll my windows, yell, no, not yet, you're too young. I want to warn him if he hasn't got her already pregnant, he's going to be soon. Her old man has no better sense than to shotgun a marriage and share with his son-in-law the hellish boredom of eight hours a day in his hardware store, counting out pounds of nails. I want to convince her she's worth legions of men willing to stand in line. I'd like to shake her up with the odds. Young lady, I'd say, you're bound to be caught short of breath one day lost inside one of these clapboard bungalows, two babies crying in the next room, and you're at the window staring at your hometown, hometown growing small. Up the drive, hubby's home for lunch. He bangs in the door with paint-stained shoes. Won't look at you, even though he's known now for two years something gnawing in him haunts you too. Dreams you see will nag you to distraction unless you run far enough away, like your neighbors, like your friends have run off into the comforts of their little padded weeks of bridge parties, bowling nights, shopping malls, gossip and sex and booze. That's life, they'll shrug, that's life. And if you feel sick with disappointment, don't, no, don't believe for an instant it's easier once you break loose. Find yourself driving through one town, blowing like a ghost through the, excuse me, blowing like a lost seed of milkweed into the next, wandering no farther than another motel mattress, and praying for two kids waving back up the road, wishing for them enough pain and confusion to wake up years forward still dreaming, driving out of town like a stranger, born again and delivered through darkness, this time each of us into his own hands. I think I, uh, I learned on the radio today I pronounced this word wrong. It's not God, it's God. <laughs> God. <laughs> I think this is the best anti war poem I ever read, or I ever wrote. Maybe I ever read. <laughs> <laughs> Trouble is, nobody else thinks that. Um, but it's called God Talks. See, I'm from the Midwest. God Talks. The guy on the radio said, God Talks. Uh, 
and, and here again, this is, um, you know, I've sort of a, I don't know if I told you this story. Once I sat down, I thought I'm going to appropriate God, you know, I'm going to have God talk. And she said, immediately it was a female voice. Here's what she said. You want an end, you think, to every battlefield. Clean up the last corpse, spade him under, grinning the good soldier's grin. Even as the dirges bugle, a lone villager struggles with his hand cart to scoop from the mud loose appendages, wedding bands, brass buttons, purses of cash. You want all the ripe bellies of hungry children filled with oatmeal. Give them shoes, make rain, give them oxen and crops. See how need sprouts. You need to watch these children bloom, famished for knowledge, starving for love. Their eyes like wide spoons will devour you in the same ravenous, unsatisfied longings for more. You ask the beast to lie down, the lion and the lamb, the murderer to put aside his knives. You would blow the gold trumpet till the gates of your prisons swing wide, the white man and the black man to rise up a chorus of fists opened, palms beseeching the sky. And I believe if you could, you would build the ladder, climb the tree, cut down the poor soul who hangs. How tenderly you would draw the nails back from his ankles, his wrists. But no, God, no, that's not what men find on this earth. That's what men die for. Thanks. Um, in King of Kings, I did this... Uh, yeah, you know, a lot of you are poets and, and writers out there, so you know that you sort of write to, to do this, um, you know, you sort of travel through life and, and writing is sort of the thing that talks to you as you go. And uh, I've been doing this King of Kings collection, you know, and you can tell by the title that I, I did a lot of looking at this character, Jesus. Um, don't worry. I mean, I can tell you I'm a homosexual, necrophiliac, kleptomaniac, but if I told you I was a born-again Christian, you would leave, wouldn't you? <laughs> it's called Door-to-Door -door Jesus. We mailed a reply card for the free gift and demonstration. Poof, there he stood, guaranteed, knocking at our door. Let's get this straight, we ask. Even if we don't buy this stuff, we still get the free gift, right? The gift? is yours, he says, <laughs> grinning back to his gums while he unlatches his sample case and whoa, out comes the sky, some oceans, mountains out of nowhere, forests, rivers, wild animals, livestock, and the chatter of birds all over the carpet, tall buildings and cities, bridges, parking lots, and malls. We ask, where are the people? Hey, what's the gimmick here? You give us this world and no one to run it. Again, he grins, points his fingers. The gift is yours. Wow, we say, okay, some of us go live in one valley, some in another. Someone else comes along and says, this is their valley. They saw it first. We tried compromise, divide the pie, and someone says, it's not fair. How come they got bigger malls, more parking? And someone else says, don't trust them. They'll cheat us. And someone else says, over my dead body. And pretty soon we got the sky mushrooming with poisonous gas, rivers in flames, wasted animals, no sign of birds anywhere, and with nothing but skin hanging loose on our bones. Presto, we're back in the living room, home where we started. The sales guy just laughs and evaporates right there, leaving us to stare at the black hole smoldering in the one good rug. Jesus, some of us say, hell of a demo. <laughs> nah, some others say, we've seen it before. This is a poem called, Why Do I Hate You? Not to my ex-wife. That's a different collection. Um, uh, I, I gotta tell you this, okay? Uh, why, why, are we, why do we hate Saddam Hussein? He's so fucking much like us. That's why we hate him. He's power hungry. 
He's ruthless. And he wants to conquer the world, right? No wonder someday we'd have to meet, you know? No wonder we really hate this guy. He represents everything we stand for. No wonder he's fighting us. So this is called, Why Do I Hate You? And it comes to the same realization, only talks about having a picnic and seeing a snake come by. Why do I hate you? Because from under a rock at the picnic, for instance, just as we've settled our blanket in the grass, just as the sun finally smiles down, just as our sandwiches we've unwrapped, just as the champagne sparkles in our glass and the apple pie smells so tempting, so tempting, of course, you slither by like shadows alive suddenly with all your dark surprise. The one lady and I both rise and flee. I despise what you do to her. I loathe what you make of me, my heart a twitch like some captured bird who in that instant knows life only or death as one long, narrow struggle to be free. And if I were bigger than you, I boast, or if I had a spade in my hand, a stick, a rock, I would have cut you in two. I would have crushed your head with my shoe. I would have diced you like salami. I would have strangled your grandmother. I would have marched you naked, your mother, father, cousins, uncles, and aunts into the showers and turned on the gas. Because we turn again and you vanished under leaves and moss, leaving us stunned on the blood of cowardice. Back at the blanket we kneel, trembling, wary, our appetites shallow, nervous, our laughter. Because you've ruined it again, the paradise of self-righteousness, we gulp a venomous toast. Because you've ruined it again, the perfect peace we've come here after. I'll, I'll finish up here real quickly. So anyway, I did this thing about looking at Jesus, and I did it sincerely, I really did. I was born and raised a, a, one of these wacky Lutheran synods in the Midwest, and turned off to all this stuff, and and now pushing 40, I thought, well, you know, I mean, I, I feel that same hollowness that most of humanity feels. And I thought maybe I should take a closer look at this thing, and I took a close look at this thing, and it turned me off again. And what turned me off again about it was that, see, I couldn't, every, they, everybody had answers, you know, everybody, like, like religions offer answers, don't they? I mean, Christianity offers an answer, so, so does the, the Islam religion offers an answer, doesn't it? Aren't they battling it out there over those answers right now? And I thought, see, I just don't know, I don't know, and, and that's why I'm a poet, because I don't know. If I knew something, I wouldn't be a poet, you know? I mean, it's a poet's job, isn't it? to look at the questions and not to know the answers, but to keep raising the questions, the point to, point to sort of the overwhelming mysteries. Um, and uh, so towards the end of this collection, there's a poem called The Answer and Its Question. The Answer and Its Question. Tonight the sun set as it does miles across the lake, burning in the boughs of pine. I stood lonely in my own home at the window feeling small, wishing I could go to ashes like a tree with the sun blazing in my arms, but go knowing something like I had touched the truth at the center of all life and died for it, which is, I guess, what I'm doing here at the window. It's exactly what we all do. Proof what comes is what we ask for. I ask for the flames of truth at the center of life and the sun set and I'm left cold each star in the night sky connected to nothing except how darkness illuminates most of creation beyond our grasp. And this is the last one I'll read. It's called God's Bird. God's Bird. Um, this is about as close as I've ever come to having a vision, you know what I mean? I'm 
I mean, without being truly loaded or something, you know. I, mean, I was actually driving, and uh, and this came to me, God's bird. Again, this is towards the end of that King of Kings collection. It's a dark night, stars blotted out. I've got an ink brush in one hand, jar of pigment black as a witch's thumbnail in the other. I'm painting what I can't say to you without choking back something in my chest that wants to cry. It has nothing to do with the facts, most of which are most of the time too close at hand to focus clearly and nothing to do with a long list of nasty shit I drag out now and again to remind me I'm better off knowing I've done worse or at least as bad as whatever I've condemned in others. Nothing to do with innocence or guilt. I'm sketching somewhere in between the essence of what it's like to be this refined animal called man. I've labeled it God's bird. And first I've fleshed out a falcon's head raised toward the blinding sun, his magnificent flashing eyes wrapped on some vision beyond the canvas, his beak opened and aiming at song. Next I've brushed quill feathers fanned into wings like clouds billowed. And last, look how those noble talons will forever in this black and white tear at the steel cords snared about this raptor's ankles, which by some cruel joke have twisted, so this bird's tethered, snug as leg irons, six inches off the ground to a big fucking bag of rocks. Thank you. Our fiction reader this evening is Brenda Miller. She grew up in South, Southern California and got her journalism BA from Humboldt. She arrived in Missoula in 1989 and is studying both poetry and fiction for an MFA. She gave us all a jolt last summer when she, got the, she won the Abraham Warsel Foundation grant for creative writing and we saw it all splashed on the front page of the paper. <laughs> Um, congratulations. <laughs> She's, her work has appeared in Seattle Weekly, The Written Arts, Spindrift, and she was our first cover poet for Knick Knick. She has worked as a massage therapist, a, a cook, and a school administrator. She's lived in Seattle, Alaska, Wyoming, and Arizona. I'd like you to welcome Brenda Miller. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here tonight and I'm very pleased to be sharing this evening with Lowell Yeager whose poetry I think is just so vital and, and so alive for our time. Um, I'm going to read two short stories tonight. Uh, the first one is very short. Um, I've been writing these short, short stories kind of as a blend between uh, poetry writing and fiction writing and they're a lot of fun. Uh, this first one is called Quick Stop. Debussy, the music brushed her, the drowsy breath of a lover. In the aisle for tuna fish and baked beans, Mona stopped, her hand hovering over the dinty moor. Debussy, she sought to remember if this had always been the case, the swell of strings, the light riffle of the piano, here at John's Grocery on the corner of 25th and Bellevue. She didn't think so. She recalled teenage boys slouched on the steps, pulsing under the loudspeaker to the tinny sounds of rock and roll. They would stare at her slant-eyed when she sidled past them, her chin tucked into her coat. Today, she felt a broad relaxation in her muscles when she walked up the steps, but hadn't noticed the boy's absence. She glanced out the plate glass window. An old woman rocked on the stoop, hugging her purse to her chest. Cars swooshed by on the damp, uncrowded street. 
Mona's head swiveled away from the window, her gaze falling evenly across the grocery store terrain, past the motor oil display, the tortilla chips, the long rack of magazines. She nodded to the proprietor, Mr. John, who stood behind the cash register like a sentinel, his hand flat on the counter, supporting the weight of his rigid, outstretched arm. He nodded imperceptibly back, his eyes flickering with disapproval. Mr. John did not believe in shopping as a pleasurable experience. He scowled at customers who lingered too long among the merchandise. That was why he installed the Debussy, the Mozart, the brooding Bach. He wanted music designed to repel what he referred to as the bad element. The radio music had attracted kids who quickly became gangs. Their spindly bodies and languid voices grated on Mr. John's sense of decorum. They wafted through the store, leaving greasy thumbprints on magazines and a plume of juvenile arousal. The trick had worked so far. The boys doubled over as if they were vomiting the day they heard this music tinkling onto the street. Mona's gaze returned to her hand. It looked lovely the way her fingers arched in this attitude of reaching. She thought of the long necks of women in paintings by Botticelli, the porcelain curve of their flesh. Mona remembered a ballet she had witnessed many years ago. The dancers drifted naked across the barren stage, borne up, clothed only in the music of Debussy. Mona sat up straight and burrowed her attention on the dancers. They were brief, ephemeral creatures, sustained by the promise of beauty, and Mona had felt the longing to stretch out her arms, bare her breasts, reveal the healthy sheen of her bones in exchange for a life of radiance. Hearing the music in this brightly lit aisle, Mona felt suddenly exposed, a coolness on her belly, and she glanced down at her body and fingered her new spring dress. Mona felt waves of extraordinary gratitude and love. Mr. John sighed and tapped his fingers on the register. The store became crowded with the regular 550 rush, more crowded than usual because the shoppers loitered and fondled their prospective purchases, as if one bag of Fritos could be different from another, Mr. John thought. He checked the front stoop. A man in a blue business suit had joined the old lady with the purse. They sat shoulder to shoulder, blocking the way of customers who stepped around them to enter the store. A young man in bicycling pants strolled up aisle B in search of peanuts. He heard the singing of violins in the back of his mind and didn't recognize it as music but as a fiery pumping of adrenaline in his blood. He found the peanuts and stood for a moment stroking the voluptuous glass jar. The next aisle over, Mona wrapped her palms around the dinty moor. At the freezer case, a young girl licked her lips in a quandary over ice cream, mistaking the piano ripple as a fleeting shiver up her spine. Secretaries gathered on the sidewalk, arcing their long, thin cigarettes in the air. Their coiffures became frizzed and unruly, but they noticed only their own gladness at being out on the streets in the silvered light. A policeman stopped at the payphone and dialed home, responding to an exhilarated but steady drumming in his heart. Mr. John stood rigid in his cashier's pen. He lifted his arm to the stereo knobs just as Mona turned and caught his eye. She felt a breeze on her skin like the rushing of silk. The bicyclist gripped his jar of peanuts. Ice cream was plucked from the case. Strings of sadness tugged at Mona's hands and she staggered to the checkout counter, anxious to pay for what she needed and step out the door for home. Uh, this next story I'm going to read is brand new. I started writing it last month, a couple of days before the U.S. started bombing in Iraq. And writing this story has been my way of coping with the emotional distress that I feel about the events that are happening now. So I would like to dedicate this piece to all of us who are struggling now to, to make some sense out of what's going on and trying to feel empowered in any way that we can. 
This story is called Acts of Aggression. <clears throat> Her period is late, and Diane suspects this must have something to do with the rampant talk of war, the congressional debates, and the long radio analyses by experts, soldiers, and mothers whose sons will be killed. The climate is one of fear coupled with unreasonable excitement, a note of bloodthirst in the general's voices, the hearty proclamations of economists, the whining of the president, so much like the yapping of a small dog at the end of its chain. Diane feels the combative air stifling all her functions, her body shutting down slowly, part by part, in protest. Outwardly, she does nothing, or nothing that counts in activist circles. She does not march, does not telegram her senator. But when she talks about the coming war, her hands flutter at her stomach, and she says, it's upsetting, very upsetting. And she means that something is happening to her on the level of flesh and blood. Her organs are tipped and in disarray. Diane does not consider the possibility of pregnancy. The doctor declared her sterile exactly five years ago. You can't be pregnant, her friend Liz says to her at work. Anything could happen, but not this. Her voice is breathless, excited. Of course not, Diane says. It's just stress is all. My body is hoarding blood in time of war. No vital fluids allowed to depart. Liz laughs. OK, darling, stop worrying. War is impossible in this day and age. You know that. They wouldn't dare. Diane's lover, Sam, is not so sure. He keeps the radio on all day as he works at his computer terminal. When Diane gets home from work, he recounts the arguments of the day. The phrase, vile act of aggression, recurs frequently from both camps. He keeps his head tilted toward the radio as he talks. Diane listens to him, but her mind wanders. She notices how pale Sam's skin has become and the wrinkle burrowed deep in his forehead. He is gnawing at the inside of his cheeks, and he looks like someone starving and gaunt. Without thinking, she reaches over and touches his face. Sam is startled, and he reflexively pulls back. Diane's hand drops to her lap, and they both sit there a second, silent, their heads bowed as if they were praying. Diane feels embarrassed more than hurt, and her pelvis is bloated. She feels cramps. Sam leans forward and rubs his hands on her knees. So, he says, are you flowing yet? No, but I'm premenstrual as hell. On the radio, a gentleman from Rhode Island recites the war crimes of the enemy, including the murder of 340 babies. Sam touches Diane's chin. What if you're pregnant, he says. His voice is hoarse with both worry and hope. His eyes behind his thick glasses are watery and owlish. I'm not, she says. Diane reaches over and flips off the radio. Haven't we heard enough of this? Sam spins around and clicks the radio back on. They're going to take a vote, he says. This is important. It's just talk. It's a pacifier. Whatever they say doesn't matter. The gentleman from Rhode Island yields to a distinguished gentleman from Colorado. Everything matters, Sam says. I am not pregnant, Diane says. She feels like she wants to hit something. Why talk like that? Why even say such a thing? Sam adjusts the volume on the radio, turning it down to a murmur. Maybe it's a miracle, he says, divine intervention. He is smiling now, and Diane doesn't think he could be serious, but something in the working of his mouth makes her wait. He fiddles with the radio, and the volume swells. Then he lowers it again. The gentleman from Colorado is pound pounding on the podium, shouting the words principle, policy, and prerogative. Maybe, Sam says, I made love to you so well I got you pregnant. Maybe I had a superhuman orgasm, unnaturally potent. Diane's fallopian tubes were removed five years ago. The ultrasound technician pointed out the hot spots of Diane's body. The tubes spread out like horns with ovaries perched at either end, the fist-sized uterus below them like a misshapen head. The images on the monitor wavered, floating underwater, as the technician pushed the wand across Diane's lubricated abdomen. Diane heard words like ectopic and pathology, but she couldn't stop thinking the word ultrasound, these sound waves penetrating her body and shooting back pictures like radar. Diane thought it was a beautiful word, and the technician was proud of her machine. 
After they were done, she took Diane's hand and they sat quietly watching the screen as if they were watching the TV news, waiting for something to happen. Sam, Diane says, that sperm would be making a giant leap of faith. <clears throat> Later, after Sam has turned off the radio and they are sitting together on the couch, reading, Diane's legs flung over Sam's knees, there is a frantic banging on the door and it opens before Diane can quite make it up from Sam's lap. Her heart is pounding, but it is only Dwayne, Sam's brother, who is a captain in the army and lives nearby, off base. He is grinning as he strides into the room, and Diane falls back against the couch, her hand over her chest. Dwayne, you scared me. Wake up, Diane, I'm always scaring you. Must be the haircut. Dwayne runs a hand across the fresh stubble on his head. I'm all dressed up and nowhere to go. Sam puts down his book and gazes at his brother. Any news, Dwayne? Little brother, get off that couch. We have work to do. Dwayne and Sam are twins, Dwayne older by three minutes, but they only look alike in pictures, never in person. Dwayne's body is compact and hard, all his movements efficient. Sam is soft and languid. They both carry a fondness for mechanical things, stroking the parts of an engine as if they were sheathed in flesh. But working side by side, they could be strangers, Dwayne snapping up the tools and lining them in rigid rows, while Sam taps his fingers against the hood and gazes into space. Diane often wonders if these differences were generated in utero, if Dwayne bobbed his little brother behind him while he writhed and kicked, eager to rush out of the womb. Diane imagines Sam floating above his brother, peacefully sucking his thumb, undisturbed by the prospect of labor. Sam closes his eyes, presses his fingers to his forehead and pretends to concentrate. Ah, he says, I'm seeing, I'm getting a definite picture of a faulty carburetor. Diane, my brother is a telepathic genius. No wonder you're wild about him. Diane gets up from the couch. Her back is sore and her head aches. Dwayne, you've been crabbing about that engine all week. She reaches up and palms Dwayne's fuzzy head. What's with the spruce job? He doesn't answer, and her hand slides off him. Dwayne glances once into her eyes, then away. Sam is watching, and he starts to get up. They're not sending you, he says. Dwayne grins and darts to the couch, tackling Sam. Sam does nothing to defend the attack, but absorbs the brunt of his brother's weight, and the two men roll off the couch onto the floor, knocking candlesticks off the coffee table. They lie there for a minute, gasping. Then Dwayne rises, pulling his brother up. <coughs> Sam's glasses wondrously remain on his head, but they are crooked behind one ear. <coughs> brother, Dwayne says, they're not sending me anywhere. This thing will be over before it gets started. Besides, I'm assigned to defend our northern flank. If they send me out, those damn Canadians will see their chance. Dwayne winks at Diane and drags Sam out the front door. Sam grabs at Diane's hand as he stumbles past, pecking her on the cheek. <clears throat> Two hours later, Diane is at the kitchen sink, making lunch for the next day, and Sam comes in the door smelling of grease. He immediately goes to the sink and washes his hands. Oil is smeared on his forehead and the bridge of his nose. How's my baby, he says. I'm all right. She leans back against the counter. He dries his hands on a dish towel, then presses them against Diane's belly. And this baby? Sam, shut up. Dwayne is excited about the prospect of a little nephew. Diane slaps his hands away. What did you tell him? Damn it, I'm not pregnant. Absolutely not. Why are you acting like this? Sam backs off, flinging his hands in the air. Sorry, I just mentioned you were late. It's none of Dwayne's business. We were just talking. Sam's voice is petulant, and Diane expects him to go into a pout, which he does. Diane has a sudden vision of herself pregnant, waddling out the door to work, coming home breathless and irritable. Even if I was pregnant, she says, and she feels a nastiness rising in her blood. Nothing's written that I'd keep it. We aren't even married. Sam refuses to look at her. He sulks into the living room and flips on the radio. Diane holds her breath a minute, but it is not voices, it is classical music, the kind you hear in a doctor's office to calm your jittery nerves. She wonders briefly if they play this on purpose, if Mozart is mandated by the government in times of impending war. 
The next morning, Diane drives to work, and on the way, she listens to more senators, more congressmen, and it seems to her that their voices have gotten more shrill overnight. She imagines spittle flying on the microphones and graphic photos of war atrocities projected onto big screens. At work, she is amazed that people can still talk of anything but the war. She overhears two women exchanging recipes for chocolate cheesecake, and a group has gathered by someone's office to debate a basketball game. But at the same time, it doesn't surprise her. She understands that life proceeds, so she looks for covert signs of stress in her co-workers and imagines dark circles under their eyes, pallid complexions. Every hour, she goes to the bathroom and checks her underwear, but still no trace of blood. The radio on the intercom system, for some reason, is tuned to a children's station, and everybody in the office moves and jerks and starts like marionettes. Diane works as a receptionist in a law firm specializing in bankruptcy, and all day she receives people who have, re who have reached a financial edge, a dangerous cliff. She is pleasant to them all, even the nasty ones who soon relent and ease up under Diane's professional smile. Today, however, her smile is defective. A pale man in an ill-fitting suit growls at her, my appointment was scheduled for one, this at 105, and Diane snaps at him, it's a busy day, sir. Her friend Liz passes behind her desk just then and tickles her fingers on the back of Diane's neck. Tense today, dear, she murmurs and beck beckons her toward the bathroom. The drug Liz offers is not cocaine, which Diane would refuse, or marijuana, which she would not, but Alka-Seltzer. Diane eyes the fizzing glass dubiously. Believe me, Liz says, it works every time. Diane doesn't believe her, but she downs it anyway. She is desperately thirsty. Liz sits at the edge of the bathroom sink and lights a cigarette. How's Sammy, she says. The same. Sam is always the same, isn't he, Liz says. Then catching Diane's sharp glance, she adds seamlessly, but sensitive, I like that. That man is sensitive, he'll talk about anything. My husband won't do that. I mean, Fred will talk if I absolutely beg him to, but he acts as if he's checking things off the list just to have them done with. Diane nods, but she isn't really listening. The radio is playing a story about a little girl who's lost the letter P because she didn't appreciate it. She goes around the world searching it out, calling, Liz, Liz, come back. Liz is examining her nails. Diane, I've told you that Fred's in the reserves. Diane rinses out her glass, fills it with water, and drinks it down in one gulp. She gazes at Liz's face, but Liz does not look up. Yes, Diane says, of course. Oh. Liz squints harder at her nails. Smoke curls around her hair. Well, he's not the military type, believe me. He joined for the money. So did everyone else. So when all this war talk started, he said, Lizzie, in my unit, we're just toy soldiers. Everyone knows that. Liz glances up at Diane. He's right. They're just toys. Diane stares at Liz and realizes for the first time that she is smoking a cigarette. Liz supposedly quit smoking a year ago. What's with the cigarette, Diane says, nodding at Liz's hand. Liz stubs the cigarette out in the sink and laughs. I don't know, honey. I just felt like it one day, and then there was one in my fingers. My brand, too. I don't know how it got there. Liz leans forward and whispers in Diane's ear. It was a hostile act of aggression from the tobacco industry. I'm gathering my forces of retaliation. <coughs> she leans back against the mirror, smiling broadly, then grabs Diane's cheeks with her fingers. Oh, darling, cheer up, please. Our job is to receive with a smile. We've got to fortify those poor idiots whose money has ceased and desisted. We can't do that with a glum face, can we? She lets go and turns around to face the mirror, leaning her head on Diane's shoulder. Diane smiles. Liz smiles. In the mirror, they could be sisters. Their hair is the same muted gold, and their half-moon smiles are identical. On the way home, Diane deliberately keeps the radio off, but she feels something is happening. She doesn't know what, but she has never felt this way before, as if everything is changing, hurtling out of control. Even when she was in the hospital, the chaos in her body felt orderly, designed. 
It was a full day before she understood that something indecent had been done to her, something the doctor refused to explain. Then anger choked in her throat, and the doctor, his face still masked, said, we could have taken the uterus too, and now, as her belly bloats and cramps, she thinks, I wish you had, you bastard. Her fingers ache and flex on the wheel. She stops at the grocery store and a newsstand. At each place, she imagines people are more worried than usual, that the monotone of Senate hearings underscores all their movements, and indeed, the sonorous voices are flowing from radios in parked cars as she passes, and from the transistor radio at the bookseller's ear. She longs to look someone in the eye and say, this is bad, this is deplorable, but she cannot do it. She already senses a dangerous futility behind even this simple an act. She buys the things she always buys, two newspapers, bread, yogurt, and milk. It is dark when she approaches the bridge, but there are lights on either side along the footpaths, lights that move and lights that remain still and lights that jump high into the air. As she gets closer, she sees that the bridge is lined with hundreds of people, most of them carrying candles, some carrying children, some sitting on the rails and waving their fingers in signs of peace. Traffic on the bridge is heavy and slow, and Diane inches her car across, looking out her window, not sure if she should wave. She hears cars honking, and she glances in the rearview mirror to see if they are honking at her, but realizes at the same moment that they are honking in solidarity with the demonstrators on the bridge. Cheers erupt from pockets of people on either side. They hold their candles high in the air. One man, older, with a white beard, leans down and waves into Diane's car as she passes. She honks once, a little toot, then leans on her horn in one big blast that bellows till she reaches land. In the hallway, Sam is crying. He has one hand on the phone, and he is crying, but Diane can't understand at first that he is doing this. She stands at the door, her coat half off, whining, Sam? Sam? The radio is on, the low yammering of voices. She had been thinking of what to make for dinner, and her mind still lists off possibilities, spaghetti, chicken, even as she stands there, watching Sam cry. He turns to her and holds out his arms. His hands are curled into fists. My brother, he says, he got his orders. What do you mean, Diane says. They haven't declared anything yet. She pulls off her coat and lets it fall on the floor. She takes a step toward him. They don't have to declare anything, Diane, Sam shouts, and the unfamiliar harshness in his voice terrifies her. She stops. Sam rolls his face against the wall, knocking the wood with his fist. The phone rings and Sam moves for it. Diane saying, wait, Sam, let it ring, but he doesn't let it ring. He answers it, then hands the receiver to Diane. He turns and walks stiffly down the hall. Diane pushes the receiver against her ear, staring at Sam's retreating back. What is it, she breathes into the phone. Diane, it's Liz. Something weird is going on. Liz, it's been weird for months. I've got to go. I can't talk now. But Diane, Fred's unit's been called. What are you talking about? Just what I said, his unit's been called. Diane, they're just toys. They're not supposed to go. Her voice rises and Diane panics. God, Liz, I can't talk to you now. I'm sorry, I'll call you back. She slams down the phone and stumbles into the hall, knocking down a picture of an ocean sunset and cracking her elbow on the bedroom door. Sam is in the bathroom, staring at himself in the mirror. His glasses are thrown in the sink and he leans forward on the counter, his forehead almost touching the glass. His eyes are glazed with red. She goes in and stands next to him, glancing at their reflections, two strangers. Neither face looks familiar to her. Sam's face is too wide without his glasses, and Diane's face looks off kilter, crooked. She touches Sam's shoulder. Diane knows he is going to do something awful before he does it. His skin is hard and unyielding, but she makes no move, only a half-gasping sound as she watches Sam's fist swing up from the counter and smash into the mirror, cracking it in eight jagged lines that move with appalling speed across the glass. Two shards break off and clatter into the sink. Blood trickles on Sam's knuckles, but not much, not at first. 
My God, Sam, Diane whispers. He whirls and grabs her by the arms. We're keeping it, Diane, he says, and she recoils, trying to twist her shoulders away, but he holds her tight. Blood spatters on Diane's shirt, a few drops, and as soon as it hits, it doesn't look like blood anymore, but rather like splotches of paint. We're keeping it, and we're getting married, and we're naming him after my brother. Sam, I'm not and we're going to pack that little baby up. We're going to pack all its little baby things, its blanket and its binky, and we're leaving this fucking country. Do you understand? We are getting the fuck out of here, and you'll nurse the baby on the plane so he won't cry, and we'll figure out how to make do. My mother will send us bagels and peanut butter, and our baby will grow up. He'll grow up safe. He is sobbing now, and his fingers loosen. Sam, Diane says. His hands are off her arms. They are groping her eyes and her cheeks. Diane, I want it, he whispers. I want it, Diane. Please, please. His head is bowed low and his hands slide off her face and down her chest. He is mumbling and she can't understand what he is saying. And just then she feels her body slacken with pain, the letting of blood. And again, Diane flashes on the doctor's strange masked face and the nurses, their eyes hot with pity and scorn. Sam is on his knees. His shoulders curl and his hands grip together, squeezing his heart. Blood dribbles onto his wrist and Diane longs to pull his face into her belly until the tears stop. She aches to do this. The radio voices whisper through the house and Diane strains to hear what they are saying. Her fingers twitch, her arms are heavy as they begin to rise. Thank you.